it's really nice to see all of you here. And I think there are both some old and new faces today. So we will start by having these presentations from uh, Vico Hubner from DFAF and EWF, followed by Julia Günsel from DFAF and then Thomas Sedlak from the European Com Commission. And they will give us an overview of what agroforestry looks like in in Europe and with special focus on policies. And after this, we will have in Swedish a discussion on the non-governmental bill or motrum that we are uh, writing. So once again, hello, good evening, everybody. My name is um, Rico Hubner. I'm uh, calling in from Germany. Uh, I'm a researcher at Technical University of Munich. I also work part-time for the German DFAF and I was elected the treasurer of URAF. And this presentation is uh, mainly a uh, work of Jerry Lawson. I just made a little fine tweaks here and there. And uh, he's also joining us today. And Jerry is a UK delegate and he's been a long time uh, supporter and staff and uh, so sort of the, the one of the main founding uh, heads of URAF. So I'm really happy that he can make it today. So, okay, what is URAF and what agroforestry policies is it advocating? Um, I can hopefully uh, give it uh, over to Jerry when we go more into the policy details, but I will first give you an overview. Okay, well, the challenge of URAF is... Uh, by its definition that it's a federation of many different organizations and you're across Europe and all of them have different agroforestry systems, agroforestry policies, different goals, different environmental conditions. So um, whatever we do at Europe is more or less uh, trying to get all these different systems under one umbrella and allowing for all the different opportunities across Europe. And that is sometimes proving challenging as, of course, each country has their own preferences and how they would like to see the agroforestry policy of, the, of, of Europe. Um, Europe is increasing its membership quite substantially from 116 members in 2016 now to more than 500. And in the next slide, I will show you a little bit where those members come from. Uh, you can see here pretty big is France and Spain, but also Germany has substantially increased its membership. And whereas uh, here we find Sweden. So Sweden is usually around so 10, 15 members. And um, we are um, uh, looking forward to, to, more, to more memberships, of course, and just recently, um, a number of countries have joined Europe, which is Ireland, um, uh, Latvia, Denmark, Austria, and very recently, Croatia. And the rules by Europe uh, say that um, as soon as a country has more than uh, five or six members, uh, then the country officially becomes uh, the membership status of uh, being member of the Europe. But members can join through their individual national organizations, but they can, of course, also join as an individual if there's no national organization or if they really do not want to be in their national organization. And so it happens that from some countries, we have members through the national organizations and additionally some individuals. Um, one of the main uh, things we want to expand in the, in the near future is integrating the work of Europe a little bit more in social media. In social media. So what we have is, of course, our website. Um, the website um, has a fantastic tool and the very top left, there's a little Google button. And when you press that, you can instantly translate the entire website with all its links and sublinks and documents, or not the documents, but at least all the articles into any language of choice. So also it can be all viewed in 
in Swedish. Um, then we have a Facebook profile that is mainly managed by Joanna from Portugal and also from Patrick and some more. Uh, parallel, there is a LinkedIn profile where we have now have, I think, also 400 uh, connections. So the photo is not quite updated. And um, we also maintain a Twitter channel. Um, there's been some confusion with the Twitter channel in the last years, but now we originally officially have a proper Europe Twitter channel. And of course, we would be very happy to have some more followers. I just uh, checked on LinkedIn and I saw only two people from Sweden follow LinkedIn. So maybe a question for discussion is what form of social media are is of uh, relevancy in Sweden? And maybe you have some tips or some ideas on how we get uh, this a little bit more professional. So you can see here like Claire Lemarie from France or Jerry from the UK or Joanna or just anybody in the board. So if you have some information to share, just drop us a line and we will put it on social media. Um, of course, maintaining this website is pretty cumbersome and we are uh, constantly improving but there's been a huge uh, step forward made recently by Anna Thomas from Portugal and together with Joao Palma the former board member and uh, now officially in charge is Claire Lemarie and I'm also a little bit helping her with uh, with the website and the, the idea is that the website articles are rather brief, let's say half a page and with some photos. And then we usually feature those articles in our quarterly newsletter. So everything that is in the newsletter will be sort of archived also on the website and vice versa. Anything on the website is broadcasted through the newsletter. In the very left of the of the website, this is a screenshot that's uh, some of the, uh, not the very latest one. You can see something that is called policy briefings. And now it's 10 policy briefings. That's mainly the work of Jerry uh, with support of the board. And there are some really interesting in-depth analysis. It's usually a two pager and uh, we will go into that uh, in a minute. And another section that I would uh, attract your attention to is the so-called pick your fact sheet. So we just managed uh, the last couple of days to upload there are now 47 fact sheets from the former really nice Arc Forward project because uh, they are in the internet, but sometimes they're really hard to find in some websites. So we tried to channel that a little bit more here and also we are already added all the translations into Greek and Italian, and we will add some more translations also to, from other languages. So these fact sheets are really a, a treasure I see in this in this website. Uh, our website is uh, hosted at the University uh, uh, of Lisboa, uh, which we are very thankful because you know universities have big servers and they don't charge us huge amounts of money because at the end of the day we are a ngo and we don't want to spend all that precious uh, membership money on server charges so we are grateful for that um, another really nice project that is also a result from the Ag forward project is the agroforestry map of europe and um, you really should check out um, uh, this website tool. Um, it's based on the Google map and you can uh, drop their information uh, that is uh, has to be added by the national delegate of the of the of your country or of the Swedish uh, Agroforestry Association, because not everybody has riding access. But uh, I I found that um, there's been recently some activity 
in Sweden and uh, especially the so-called uh, um, uh, multi-layered or multifunctional or or, or um, uh, food forest kind of uh, type uh, agroforestry system uh, was added so far, but I'm pretty sure that there are also more, um, let's say, standard agricultural type of agroforestry systems in Sweden. So I would really encourage you, if you are aware of something, um, contact your national delegate. And uh, what we need is not that much, it's really just, just a point. It can be there directly or nearby and a name. And then a small text, um, maybe a little paragraph and some two one or two pictures, and then we are happy because this map really gets huge amounts of clicks and uh, it shows really people across Europe on the diversity and the, and the opportunities of forestry. So um, I think many people like it. Um, of course, one of the things that we do at uh, Europe is um, trying to promote agroforestry across science, across farmers and think tanks, uh, NGOs and so on. And that is, has been done very successfully in organizing conferences. Um, maybe some of you already attended one of the agroforestry uh, conferences organized or co-organized by Europe, and uh, we all very much look forward to getting together again. But unfortunately, the uh, Nuovo conference had to be put online because it's just uh, too too too. Uh, it's been we've been postponing it two times already, as you can see. But now um, we have decided to do it entirely online. It will be take undertaken in uh, in three three uh, half day events and um, you can register it's a reduced fee it costs 100 euro to participate um, however the Italian uh, delegation uh, together with the University of Sardinia and the other organizers agreed that they will uh, do the in-person conference again uh, next year and we are very much uh, hoping and looking forward to that. And I think once everybody or most people are vaccinated, that this will be possible. So it will be no in 2022. So the conference is called 2020 because this was initially planned. Now it will take in 21, but the in-place, in-person uh, uh, a conference will take in 22. So as Patrick would say, we are happy about we are back on schedule. Um, a famous conference was, of course, the World uh, Agroforestry Conference that took place in Mopee. Uh, all the material uh, is still online. Um, probably we will share this presentation and uh, you can access the link, but you can also find on, on our website. And uh, Europe had uh, a little stand where you could uh, taste the uh, Iberian uh, 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 pork. Uh, Jerry carried all the way in the train. And uh, also uh, here's a sketch of Patrick, the, the current president of, of the um, Europe. Uh, Patrick Worms in Brussels stops subsidizing industrial agriculture <laughs> and then somebody calls for security. So so we had a, a cartoon artist that was portraying the main speaker. So this was kind of fun. Um, now getting more into serious business, um, Euraf uh, is lucky to have two seats at the so-called civil dialogue groups. And the civil dialogue groups usually are meeting um, four times, three, four times per year per topic. And all the big uh, and not so big NGOs in uh, Europe, but also some business partners are invited to comment uh, current policy development. And then also delegations are, from the commissions are there and they are also presenting work and so on. So it's kind of a networking event that took place in Brussels. Now, since uh, a year and a half, of course, this was not more, no more possible. And all that is taking place online. And uh, everybody basically uh, that contacts us has a chance to participate, um, especially we look forward in welcoming 
um, farmers uh, to take place uh, to take part in these rounds. And uh, here you can see so arable farming, direct payment and greening, CAP, uh, environment and climate, forestry and cork, organic farming and rural development. These are the ones where we where we have some seeds. We had some more seeds and some like uh, 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 I think uh, hemp and others, but I think these are the ones that are most relevant for for agroforestry. And we are happy that we always find volunteers that participate because we are a little bit afraid that if we do not take up those seats, they are given because there are so many NGOs out there that would be happy to take part in that. So a great uh, opportunity to to meet and to to also raise your voice about current um, uh, policy developments. Um, <clears throat> Of course, agroforestry, as I said in the beginning, is a complex thing across Europe. The different countries all see um, agroforestry different in Latvia or in, in the northern countries like reindeer uh, herding or reindeer uh, uh, grazing is seen as a type of agroforestry. And in the in the Italian and Spanish region, of course, olive groves are and then you have the, the Streuobst, which is typical for German, and then you have the uh, copper, uh, uh, coppice uh, growing, uh, fast growing woods, um, and so on and so forth. So one of the one of the projects that we came up was trying to find a typology uh, that fits uh, for all uh, for all European countries that are part of Europe. Now. Um, Basically, well, this is maybe a little bit too much uh, in one uh, uh, slide, but here are listed the main agroforestry relevant policies that we um, in Europe think that should be uh, taken into account or that should be changed a little bit or should be accepted in different in different uh, policy developments. And I, I'm not sure, Jerry, are you are you? Are you comfortable in 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 commenting this a little bit, or um... I, I could, if you like. Uh, how much time do we have in the for the overall presentation? Well, we have sixteen minutes le uh, used up already. But if you have maybe another five minutes or something, because after that there's uh, not much. That, that's pretty at the end yet now. Okay, um, so I'll try to go through these quickly um, because these are the, all the recommendations that we made in the policy briefings, which Rico mentioned that you can see on the website. So there are 10 policy briefings, each one of which made some recommendations. So this is a list of 16, I think, total. So there's list, this slide and one more. So the top one that, that you can see is talking about this magic thing called the LPIS, the Land Parcel Identification System. It sounds very exotic, but to farmers it's crucial because this is a map of their farm uh, and ortho photographs of their farm that identify the land use. And the first thing we're trying to do, which probably we will not be successful in, in this CAP, is have agroforestry recognized as a land use code. Okay, so that's probably not going to happen. It's too much to ask for. Also, the countries don't really like to change what they've been doing for a number of years, but I think uh, as a long-term goal, we should look, we should look towards that. Um, but what is more important in the context of the next CAP is the clear identification of landscape features. Um, these are, there's a discussion about what they should be called, but often they're called non-productive areas or ecologically sensitive areas or, or pro-ecology areas, whatever. The current policy, it's still being debated uh, by trialogue between the commission, parliament, member states, is that there should be a 10% um, a threshold that each country should maintain of this so-called non-productive area. Now, trees are crucial to that. So trees in lines, individual trees and groups of trees 
are counted towards that 10% threshold. So recommendation two is that all countries should greatly improve the techniques that they use to identify lines of trees and isolated trees on farms. Some countries are very good. Some countries are much lazier in what they do. There's actually no excuse now for poor identification of those tree-based features because we have all the technology, we have all the satellite imagery. It's just a inertia by the member states if they don't bring their systems up to up to scratch so number two was a recommendation that by 2023 that all countries should be able to do that um, similarly there's a recommendation that three billion trees b-i-l-l-i -L -L with b -E -L, should be planted uh in Europe as part of the, for the forest strategy. Um, our recommendation is that the forest strategy should also con consider trees outside the forest and that we already have a huge number of um, forests in, in Europe and often not enough land to be able to plant more forest and that we should be much more focused on the establishment of trees outside the forest and we've produced maps and other for other policies to back that up. Um, similarly, number four is talking about the entitlement to basic payments. Um, that is usually the reason, and Thomas will be talking about this later, the worry about losing your basic payments on your farm if you plant trees is one of the main reasons why farmers do not adopt the agroforestry planting schemes which actually are available. So in number four, it's crucial that the rules should be clear and transparent. And if you get a money for an agroforestry planting scheme, you should surely be guaranteed continuing access to the, uh, the pillar one, to the basic payments. Um, so number five is talking about um, conditionality rules. Those will exist in Sweden. I think it's important to see that those conditionality rules, which are which all farmers, every single farmer has to, has to comply with. It's important that the role of trees outside the forest is mentioned within those. Number six is talking about um, um, oh, the, the importance of including agroforestry within thresholds. I better speed up a, lit, uh, a bit. So seven, you can read probably a bit technical eight um eight there's a lot of confusion about just what the the threshold the width allowed for a landscape feature was um and other in sweden for example how wide a hedge is allowed to be in order for it still to to be fully paid to be fully eligible for basic payments but the european limit is 20 meters many countries have stipulated only two meters so there's a lot more flexibility in the national rules there i better move on uh, quickly Rico, to number two um so no, re recommendation number nine is talking about eco schemes which are very important it may well be that thomas is able to mention a little bit about those agroforestry is mentioned as one of the uh, one of the the target eco schemes one of the example eco schemes which is good we like but uh, again it may not be taken up very much by member states pillar two there is an existing grant um, submeasure 8.2 in the next cap it won't be called that but we hope there will be something similar implemented by by all member states similarly there's submeasure 8.3 and 8.4 that thomas will talk about it's important that those forestry measures should also recognize the opportunity of agroforestry as a mechanism of fire control within forests. And I see that last summer, even in, even in Sweden, the fires. Um, so the rest are all talking about indicators. Number 13 is quite important because there is currently an indicator that reads a forested land, and then it says comma, including agroforestry. And our stress all the time is that agroforestry is not, repeat not, afforestation, because the land remains agriculture. So we, I think we've convinced the commission to change that wording. I don't know whether it's got through the discussion with, um, with, uh, with the council, with the member states. Um, similarly, I think result indicator 29 was removed by the agricultural ministers. I think it's got put back in. 
um, as a as a as a key indicator because we see these these lines of trees, groups of trees as being vital. Um, and similarly, we want more reporting taking place on the establishment of trees outside the forest. Uh, 15 is actually a mention. Um, it's a mention again, which Thomas will know about quite, quite deeply. There are certain member states, so Ireland, the Netherlands, and many of the German lender, three of the German lender, which actually fund forestry completely outside the CAP. So it's actually, in many cases, quite difficult to find out what they're doing um, in terms of the forestry spending. It's still assisted by Europe, but it's not formally reported on um, as part of Measure 8. So in the new, even more flexible <laughs> CAP, we don't want to lose uh, the reporting that should be going on on, on forestry uh, <laughs> within the reports made by member states. Um, I'll stop there. Over to you, Rico. Yes. Well, uh, as you heard, it's complex. So uh, thank you, Jerry. <laughs> it, this was really a, a wild ride through the, the cap re with respect to agroforestry. Yeah. Um, but we have time for discussion. Now I will um, uh, lead over to the German Agroforestry Association. So uh, Europe functions in the following that we have uh, so-called the executive committee and the executive committee is built up by two delegates from each country and uh, currently from germany it's uh, christopher mohart from freiburg university and julia from julia Günzel from the defaf and here you see a little map uh, i created that shows where the german uh, europe members come from and as you can see, we still have a, a long way uh, to go. So, for example, in uh, some states like in Thuringia or in uh, Saxony or in Rheinland-Pfalz and so on, so there are very few um, that joined Europe, but um, uh, Julia will now continue and explain a little bit more about DEFAF and its work. So thank you so far. So I think you should see the my screen now i hope yes okay so um yeah i will tell you a little bit about the organization the so-called defaf and also on the latest um successes on the political level um which happened in germany this year so just shortly to the background um to on agroforestry in germany because often in Germany, in the population, the reputation of agroforestry is rather that it's um, more or less short rotation coppice, because this is one common system which is eligible for agricultural subsidies currently. Um, uh, but this is, of course, not the case. And recently, there's also some changing attitude, um, not only in within the population, but also on the political level. So, um, because we have quite a lot of traditional, but also modern systems that are more diverse than just short rotation copies. One very um, typical traditional German agroforestry system is, for example, the so-called Streuobstwiese. Um, so that's like a fruit orchard. Or here in the right corner on the top, we see a very recent new agroforestry system, which is um uh, which has been established in the frame of a research projects uh, project so we have quite a few um uh, very interesting pr uh, projects going on so uh, currently the um legal compliance for establishing new agroforestry systems is very limited so we have some um possibilities and um, examples are, for example, the um, fruit orchards, or we also have some agroforestry systems along water banks, or actually also the um, coppicing, which is a popular system um, in com combination, for example, with uh, cereals. Um, uh, so that's um, some, yeah, some systems that exist. Um, uh, what we actually try to push forward is that there um, is in future like a yeah like legal security for farmers to um, so they they know that 
um, on the long term, they can really establish agroforestry systems without fearing for the agricultural land. And um, it's uh, we also hope that the uh, regularities that will come are so um, well open or flexible that um, uh, uh, yeah, like a diverse systems are possible. So it's not just um, focusing in one or two systems that are um, uh, practical for the farmer, for, for the modern farmer, but we really want a big range of um, diverse systems. So the latest re uh, development in Germany was um, happening in January um, because the German parliament, the Bundestag, they approved a proposal for the promotion of agroforestry. So that was like a first success and we were really happy about that news. Uh, here you see the news um, which has been announced by the Euro, for example, also. Um, so um, that was one step in the right direction. And now the next step is that these regulations will be um, established. So um, how did we get there? Um, the initial situation in Germany was that um, we had a lot of research projects on agroforestry. And this was especially the case in Brandenburg, where we have really degraded soils, um, for example, also because of the coal mining, but also because we have um, very low and also decreasing precipitation rates, um, global change, uh, cl uh, climate change, that's one reason, but also um, because Brandenburg, the um, eastern part of Germany, is a very, very dry area. Uh, and also in Southwest Germany, we had some research uh, activities that had been influenced a little bit by the France uh, or French um, uh, yeah, agroforestry system. So there was the focus um, more or less on um, agroforestry, on agricultural uh, spots um, or fields um, and with the, with the aim to produce high quality wood. So these were the yeah the two main um, uh, research activities, but there were quite a lot of range of different projects on this. So um, there were actually several years of persuading um, and trying to convince people or well yeah um, target groups that uh, are important to um, establish agroforestry systems systems on a long term. So there was um, continuous research on agroforestry in different um, with different focuses. Um, here you see, for example, Signal, which is now, I think, in the third phase. So there were some projects before as well. And then um, with a strong focus on East Germany, there was the um, project Aufwerten, um, so like an innovation group that um, has been going on, I think, for five years. And um, one of the result of this project was the so-called innovation concept which is a concept for uh, promoting agroforestry in Germany. And um, uh, among others, there was also like a roadmap um, uh, that was um, developed to, uh, yeah, to present uh, important steps um, that should be taken in order to promote agroforestry on the long term in Germany. So this was like a um, like many years of work that had been going on before the DFAF actually came. Um, so uh, with these projects, there had been um, some tools uh, for planners, for farmers and also advisors. Um, they have been developed. Um, uh, we also had a web page, which now actually is also the web page of the DFAF. So we kind of continue to use it. Um, so there were, yeah, there was a range of tools that um, have been the result of the research projects, and from um, with the time, actually, also these research uh, research um, results have been uh, have been uh, have become more um, more public. So like many um, people actually. Um, and it started to understand the sense of agroforestry. And uh, one uh, one um, aim was also to, uh, for example, here, the agroforestry labels. Um, uh, there was one approach to um, try how the population, for example, is reacting on um, products that uh, have been um, produced in agroforestry systems. So there were some different approaches, approaches that have been tested out within the projects. So um, as well, we have a conference um, similar to the Europe conference uh, every second year. So that has been going on since a few years now and um, is now like a um, quite well 
elaborated um, uh, conference. So in 2019, um, we had the last conference, there were more than 200 participants. So you can actually see that there's quite some interest now in the topic in Germany. And here you can see a map which shows uh, where the people have uh, come from who participated in the uh, conference. So in 2019, the people are not on the map yet, but you can see that East Germany is more or less, um, uh, you have people from um, yeah, uh, almost all the um, uh, uh, divisions in East Germany. So, um, but we also have a long way to go to actually try to get people from all of Germany. So um, this year we will have the next conference, um, which is in September. So we are hoping that we attract more and more people um, to spread the word. Uh, word. Um, so the work of the DFAF. Um, we were founded in 2019 and the projects that I had presented before, especially the innovation group, um, uh, as a result of this project, actually the DEFA was, um, uh, came out. So because um, people realized that we actually need like an organization that is behind agroforestry and has, is like a, um, uh, uh, like in, like a, yeah, specific organization that actually can apply for a project that can really do lobbying. So um, that's how it came that we were more than yeah 80 founding members um, in 2019, which is quite a lot already. And um, because of the work that had been done before, uh, we are actually a quite big and interdisciplinary network of people that already have some quite some competencies in the top in the topic of agroforestry and that are well connected. For example, Rico with the URAF and um, who was also involved in some research project. And we have quite a lot of people that um, have been active in this uh, topic. So that is actually quite a um, good base for our work now. And um, with the foundation of the DEFAF, we um, uh, established altogether nine thematic divisions, which you can see in the brown um, box. So one of them is the uh, division legislation and administration. So this is the one that is also focusing on the political uh, level and um, the regulations all around agroforestry. So with these thematic divisions, we try to facilitate the work of the DFAF. Um, but also all of this work or almost all of this work is um, voluntarily. So it depends a little bit on the thematic divisions. Not all of them are very active, but one of the most active ones is actually the, um, or has been the division for legislation and administration. So um, our work also consists of um, continuing the work that has been done in some of the research projects before. For example, um, continuing the website, which is um, which we try to develop further to more like an information hub um, with uh, important information, um, news about agroforestry, but also guidebooks, um, like everything that somehow is helpful to promote agroforestry. So we also, similar to the Europe, we developed um, an agroforestry map for Germany, which you see here in the corner. So this is also still growing. So um, people can actually um, put in their agricultural spots, uh, ag agricultural, uh, sorry, agroforestry systems. So for us, this is also um, helping to create like a database on um, agroforestry systems in Germany. And since uh, we have this map since November, so since then, quite a, a few spots have been, uh, or systems have been uh, integrated already. So we also have a regular newsletter on agroforestry. Uh, last year, uh, it came out three times per year. This year, we hope to manage four times, so we get like a more regular basis. And um, this is also somehow like the structure that has been started in the research project um, from this innovation group. So we are really um, also picking up on that one. So bringing agroforestry forward, um, like one uh, very important um, uh, yeah, um, work we are doing to um, bring it forward is um, next to this general public relation, for example, through the um, newsletter or the website also um, 
uh, strategically putting information online. For example, we are also having a Twitter account and a Facebook account. We recently published a, a brochure on agroforestry, which is actually uh, describing agroforestry in a quite general um, uh, a form so we can actually reach really people that have not um, dealt with this topic before because we really want to bring it um, to most uh, to as many people as we can um, we also participate and um, in talks or events for example we have sometimes presentations like today and other events um, uh, also with other organizations um, or other ngos for example and we try to uh, publish articles, for example, in magazines or also on our website um, on the topic to um, really spread the word. Uh, word. Um, so what was really an important step is actually the participation in some uh, working groups with other associations. Uh, one is the roundtable of the German Farmer Association. So that's where we were also part of to um, bring in our expertise on agroforestry. And we are also take um, are also part of a platform of nonprofit associations that um, uh, really try to um, yeah push for a more ecological agricultural sector, and um, they sometimes. Uh, have official statements or they um, write official statements to the government and that's where we also co-signed if we think uh, or thought that um, this is something we can also support um, because of course we are there for the agroforestry sector and the other organizations have their own um, specialties for example there's Greenpeace on this platform but also other nature conservation um, organizations so each um, organization has its own focus so um, the second um, very important uh, work we did on the political level was um, uh, something like a, an initiative on the federal on the level of the federal states in Germany. Since we have many federal states that sometimes like to do the things on their own, and every uh, federal state a little bit different than the other one, so uh, the our thematic division legislation and administration tried to um, appeal to some politicians in on these federal states uh, of these federal states and try to um, uh, promote agroforestry as a sustainable land use method so there have been some successes in some federal sta states for example here you see the uh, like a newspaper news, newspaper article about a minister for um, agriculture who was actually um, very publicly um, saying that she wants to su support um, agroforestry and she hopes for a promotion, also financial promotion of agroforestry in the future. So um, also we uh, were part or we um, got the chance to advise the Ministry um, of Germany also on some drafts for um, including agroforestry and also we um, uh, on our own we are trying to bring out sometimes official statements um, on the topic of agroforestry we wrote, uh, wrote some letters also to the minister um, our minister of agriculture to really address the politicians actively and um, emphasize how important uh, promotion or like fun, um, financial support for agroforestry really is so this um, these are some steps towards the um, uh, towards these first successes um, and we think we also had a part in that but um, we are not done yet so um, we are still hoping that the regulations will um, be uh, changed in a way that agroforestry can really soon be developed more in Germany. So um, this shortly um, from my side, and I think um, now in the discussion we can also clarify some more questions um, that you have. So briefly, I would would introduce you uh, state of play of agroforestry. I'm a I'm like working for the European Commission, DG Agriculture. I'm a forestry expert, and actually, my second university thesis was agroforestry in Hungary. This was the first thesis on agroforestry in '92. So, in in brief, just to be clear about the the history. So, in 2005, we managed to put 
Agrofor Institute of Renewable Development and Regulation. So this was the first period starting 2007 till 13, when this new measure, which is actually traditional agricultural practice, has been introduced to the renewable development programs. Originally, 19 programs programmed this, but eight abandoned. Uh, and uh, the reported EU money was 1.5 million and 275 beneficiaries established less than 3,000 hectares of agroforestry system. You can see on the map the, those programs or countries who are managed it. One of the biggest area was established in, in Hungary. So it is just repeating basically what I mentioned in the first. So it was really low implementation. You know, this seven percent was not so big. And uh, at the time we have slightly more indicators what we have at this moment, basically conifers and broadleaf. So broadleaf species were mostly planted, 64%, and conifers were all used only less than four hectares in, in far outer Australia. And 61% uh, of, of agroforestry system has been established on grassland and using broadleaves, and almost 30% of agroforestry covered arable farming area. I should mention that in 2005, there was a final day a year for the safe silver arable agroforestry system projects, and that was really helpful. And I would say that the biggest possibility for agroforestry is the silver, silver arable system, because we have huge arable areas. And concerning that, current situation, as it was Gary mentioned, that we have this 8.2 measure 8.2, the agroforestry measures, and this title and the coverage of this agroforestry measure changed, improved significantly by the so-called omnibus regulation in 2017, introducing more flexibility, particularly based on the strong request from some Mediterranean countries, the regeneration, so not only establishing a new agroforestry system, but the regeneration or renovation of the existing agroforestry system. This is very big issue for Portugal, Spain, because certain old agroforestry system are dying due to this climate change and heat waves. So, and in the original formulation of the agroforestry, just that with the new agroforestry system. And also as a comparing to the previous, to the first period, there was a novum that already under the current system, we can pay for the maintenance for five years of the agroforestry system. And this is very, very important because not only establishing a system, but running it, replacing the dying trees, so some maintenance cost is also covered. There are some not complicated rules from rural development point of view, minimum and maximum number of trees per hectare had to be designed or planned in the application. And what is important, need to ensure the sustainable agriculture use of the land because the land remains as agricultural area. And uh, when it was planned, so when this programming period started also with some delay in 2015, 16, around 36 programs, we have 109 rural development programs at this moment, 
still in EU 28 level because still are running programs. So 36 plans originally, but later some programs abandoned again. And the latest was, as I realized, Greece uh, left. So already we have seven member states and 30 rural development programs with so-called hopefully active agroforestry system. And originally 84,000 hectare new system was planned. The actual updated number because every program are going through almost annual or even more modifications. So the actual target number is 60,000 hectare of new agroforestry system using 64 million euro total public expenditure. Originally it was 130 million. And the uh, actual spending, this is, sorry for these several brackets, but this is the condensed form of the information. So actually by the end of 2019, 3.3 million euro total public expenditure was used from this plan or target 64 million. And uh, they, who, who are implementing actually or implementing and reporting. So these six countries, Belgium, Spain, France, Italy, Portugal, and UK, reported the implementation or establishment of 2,136 hectares. And uh, so this is the real implementation by the end of 2019, still on the plan. And the plan, as I mentioned, always changing. France updated their plan, so already the plan is 3,600 and reported as implementation by more than 500 hectares. And Spain reported 600 hectare implementation, and but still the target is 45,000. And Portugal more than four, uh, more than 5,000 hectares and implemented 820 hectares. And why, why this brilliant implementation? lack of information for the farmers and also the land managers. And so there is a need for really active information actions and, and field visits. Anyway, these information actions and field visits are supported through rural development. So in theory, the financing shouldn't be problematic. And also lack of information for the management authorities, or they are not following some, at least the changing rules. For example, these opened possibilities from 2018 for regeneration and renewal, and also the rules concerning the direct payment, as it was earlier mentioned, because also this uh, omnibus regulation introduced some ease, some easing some simplification concerning the, the direct payment eligibility rules. So there is no risk, basically significant risk to lose the direct payment entitlements when you are introducing agroforestry system. So the current rules are more flexible than it was at the beginning of the programming period. And the future rules, the, the rules under just discussion, still discussion, will be more flexible. I mean, this means less restrictions from the member states level and more possibilities for member states level. So it is really up to the member states how they will form or complicate the, the national rules. And of course, there are competitive land use form and measures, for example, at the environment measures for deforestation. But I would say you shouldn't worry about deforestation because 
the plant, the originally planned 650,000 hectare afforestation, which was planned in 2016. Now the plan is 250,000, and the implementation by the end of 2019 was around 70,000. So not so big. And yeah, the payment level is under the current system 80%. And let's see whether it will stay for, or for increase for the future. But at least 80% of the establishment was not so bad when you are concerning or thinking about that still you have regular agricultural income and you have a payment for maintenance costs. Yeah. Us, I'm, I'm sorry, but we are approaching the end. Yeah, um, I, I, so I'm approaching to too. Up? Yeah, basically, these are the measures which contribute to the success of the, the agroforestry. So even cooperation and, and others, and it was mentioned this, some grazing can be used for fire prevention. And under the new system, as I mentioned, more flexibility, the definition of arable land, permanent grassland will be much more flexible, much more agroforestry friendly, and also the agriculture ag activity. And in general, there's a strong support for agroforestry in the draft uh, regulation, but still in under discussion. I'm finished, thank you. I was a bit sad to hear that we will not have these possibilities of having the codes for agroforestry systems at the moment. I think that's something that would really have helped farmers a lot. Elsa, yeah? if I could just make a comment on that, perhaps I was being overly pessimistic. There's nothing to stop Sweden um, pushing for that. So you need to talk to the Swedish Agricultural Minister and ask them how they are recording agroforestry and how they are recording trees on land. There are, for example, traditional agroforestry systems in Sweden. If you can push for those to be given a code, then that would be wonderful. The more countries ask for it, the more likely it is, it is to happen at a European level. The LPIS, the Land Parcel Identification System, is coordinated by the Joint Research Centre in ISPRA in Italy, but they do what the member states ask them to do. They, they, they can't lead. They can't lead on policy. But if the policy changes, they have to include agroforestry. So agroforestry is included as part of the ecological focus areas okay if you know about the greening measure then agroforestry is one of those greening measures so new agroforestry the, the statistics that thomas included those areas are are mapped they do exist and make every state has to map them but it's a tiny amount of land because the rules are so restrictive. It's only on arable land. Um, it's only uh, if it was, so agroforestry is only included if it was part of measure 222 or submeasure 8.2, yeah? So, so all those things are so, so restrictive that it means there's only a few hectares in every, in every country but still the, the code exists for, for that to be done. Um, similarly, um, you need to push the countries on how, what they define for the point of view of basic payments, yep, direct payments. The law, the, the European regulation says that agriculture must remain predominant. That's the word. So what does each country call predominant? Some countries do, do it by measuring the crown cover and saying if the crown cover is more than X percentage, say more than 50%, then the money is lost. There's no reason to do that because agriculture, grazing, even cropping happens underneath the crown cover. So in, in England, for example, um, although it's left, they did implement the rule that predominant meant 50% of the ground cover. 
crown, not the crown cover of the trees. And if Sweden, in Sweden, if you can push for that as well, which is quite easy, really, um, th then that would be a good, a good tactic, I think, to employ. But you need to build friendships with the people in the Swedish Agricultural Ministry and understand their problems and help them with the problems rather than confronting them.